A correlation coefficient, known as Pearson's r, is bounded by negative 1, which means a perfect negative or inverse correlation, and plus 1, which is a perfect positive or direct correlation. 0 means no correlation. So a positive correlation is a direct relationship, and a negative correlation is an inverse relationship. And an example would be the relationship between height and weight, which is uh, in the figure to the right. That's a positive or direct relationship because, in general, taller people weigh more. So I'm 6'2", and I weigh 180, which is probably more than someone who's 5'2". Correlation does not imply causation due to the possibility of a confounding variable. So, for example, there is a relationship, a positive correlation between ice cream and drowning. The more ice cream that's sold, the more people drown. Now, that's not because ice cream causes people to drown. It's because uh, both are related to summertime. More people are swimming, more people are eating ice cream. You might also find illusory correlations. Those occur when people believe relationships exist between variables. So some people think that there's a relationship between the moon phase and mood, and the DAP is the draw person test, um, which is also an illusory correlation. I always remember an illustrative Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown tells Linus that he drew his hands behind his back because he's insecure, and Linus says, no, it's because he can't draw hands. That's illusory correlation. So why does this occur? Well, one answer is confirmation bias. And this is when we believe something to be true, we seek supportive evidence and ignore non-supportive evidence. So for example, research shows that in automotive shopping, people do research after they buy a car to confirm that they made a good choice, when obviously you should do the research before you go shopping. Most basic experimental designs have two groups, an experimental group and a control group, and they're treated the same except for the experimental manipulation. An operational definition is the precise meaning of a variable within an experiment. Now, operational definitions are necessary, but they're always insufficient. So if we were studying something like violent behavior, we might include hitting and kicking, but not abusive verbal behavior which is certainly a violent act, but again, uh, that's why these are necessary, but always insufficient. Where do you draw the line at what is a violent act or violent behavior? Experimenter bias is when researchers' expectations may skew the results of the study. And so a way to deal with experimenter bias is through single or double blind studies. In a single blind study, participants don't know what group they're in, so they don't know if they're in the experimental group or the control group. In a double blind study, neither the participants nor the researchers know the group that the participants are in. The placebo effect is, shows that ex expectations can influence outcomes. So if you're given a pill and told that it'll make you drowsy, you might actually fall asleep. An independent variable is manipulated by the experimenter, and a dependent variable is measured by the experimenter. So one of the reasons why it's called a dependent variable is because its value is thought to be dependent on whether you receive the independent variable or not. Participants are often college students, and this leads to what's called the volunteer problem, because college students tend to be younger, more educated, more broad-minded, uh, and less diverse than the general population. So again, this is an external validity issue. Ideally, we like to work from a random sample, and that's when every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected for being in the study. But those really occur only in textbooks. Much more common is random assignment, and this is when all participants have an equal chance of being assigned to either group in an experiment. And that's really critical for sound experimental design. Once your data is collected, a statistical analysis is conducted to see if there are meaningful differences between your groups. Differences are significant if there's a 5% or less likelihood that that result is due to chance. And that's what's known as the alpha level. 
Experiments assert that significant differences are due to the impact of the independent variable. Now, the APA publishes a style manual for submitting your paper for peer review. And that's the book that I wrote on how to teach, uh, to teach students how to write in APA style. These peers anonymously judge the value of your research, and they're usually professionals and scholars who are actively involved in research themselves. One of the reasons why they're studying or uh, examining your research is due to the replication. So peer review makes sure that other scientists can replicate the research, which means that they can repeat it and get the same results, which is crucial to the scientific method. Reliability is all about consistency, but being consistent is not the same as being correct. So for example, as I said earlier, I weigh 180 pounds, but I may get on a scale that says I weigh 130 pounds. Then I might step off it again and step on it again, and it says I weigh 130, degree, 130 degrees, 130 pounds again. Now that scale is reliable because it's giving me the same weight over and over again, but it's not valid, at least in, unless I've lost several limbs and suddenly weigh 50 pounds less. Validity is all about truth. So the extent to which a given instrument accu accurately measures what it's supposed to measure is its validity. For a measure to be valid, it has to be reliable. But like I said before, uh, with weight, a reliable measure doesn't have to be valid. So a legitimate question to ask is, do the ACT and SAT correctly measure scholastic aptitude? Are they reliable and valid measures? Let's talk about ethics and research. So an IRB is an institutional review board, and that's a committee that reviews proposals for research involving human participants. Now, the inform you'll have to sign an informed consent form, and that tells you what participants can expect, including the risks and implications of the research. And you're also informed of your rights, such as the, the fact that your participation is completely voluntary and that you're free to withdraw from the study at any time. Deception involves purposely misleading participants. And so the picture is actually from the Milgram obedience experiment where participants were told that they were shocking people to death. Now they weren't really, they were being deceived. Debriefing happens at the conclusion of a study and it tells participants what the purpose of the experiment was, how the data was used, and if deception was used, why it was necessary. Let's talk about research with animals too. Researchers often use rats, mice, and birds as research subjects, and the APA estimates that 90% of animals that are used in research are in fact rats, mice, and birds. They're considered to be substitutes uh, for research that would be unethical if it was done to human participants. And you would have an IACUC, which is an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, and that's basically what an animal research IRB is. And they ensure the humane treatment of animal research subjects. Well, to finish up, I will remind you again that all your APA problems can be solved through Learn APA Style. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, you can consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Thanks for listening.